I'd like to ask you a question. How many of you have a Facebook account or a Twitter account? Just raise your hand if you have a Facebook or Twitter account. You know, there are over 400 Facebook accounts right now. That would be, if those 400 people, that would be the third largest country in the world. Just if those Facebook accounts were all added together and put in one place. The third largest country. And so, that most of those 400 accounts, the average, have 100 to 30 to 150 friends on their account. And if 130 friends are on their account, the average person spends 55 minutes a day looking at their Facebook wall. 55 minutes a day. And most of those are probably why we're at work or late at night. And then we're not even talking about a Twitter account. Social media has become one of the greatest, strongest powers of communication that there is. In the new generation, social media is more important than broadcast news. You get more information instantaneously than any other network that you could possibly have. Social media is a very positive influence if it is handled correctly. But the other side of that, social media could be very devastating in our society if social media is not handled correctly. Social media, the power of a word, the power of our attitude. I am so thankful that I was born and I am raised in the United States of America. I am so thankful that my forefathers and men and women have died for the freedom for me to have freedom of speech. I am thankful that I can have my positions. I love my positions. But you know what? My positions are my positions. First and foremost, I live in America. I thank God for that. But there was a day that I gave my life not to America, but to Jesus. And when I gave my life to Christ, I have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have a reputation. I have a mandate by God to hold up to God's word instead of my opinion. The problem with that is when we take our culture today and we take the United States of America in the division that we have, whether it's a race issue or whether it's a culture issue, and we take those issues and we do not firmly put the word of God in the midst of those issues, what we become, we become a social organization without the power of God to change people's lives. So let me put it this way. If Glenville or the church in general ever becomes a racist church, not just black and white. We're talking Hispanic, we're talking Indian, we're talking white. It doesn't make any difference what our culture is or what our ethnicity is. What makes a difference? Do we have the power of God to change people's lives? And if we ever become a racist church, what happens is we might as well just throw every missionary dollar that we've ever given to the worldwide missions and throw it out the door because that one word that Christ is telling us to be is to be love. Look in people's lives and look in people's hearts and love them for who they are and understand that they need Christ and we are the ambassadors that Christ has given his life for to share this dark and dying world the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But if we take the church, take our political and our social positions and we say, I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what people think that I am saying and I say that, and I pollute everybody around me, and I agree to every position everybody else has, but yet we do not share the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in every avenue of our speech and my communication. We are saying that the position that I hold is more important than the position I have, and the position I hold may be my agenda, but the position I hold is in Christ. And I want to give you a few words of encouragement. I want to talk to you today. I believe it is a very important topic. Social media. Position in our word, in our communication. If we do not learn to think before we post, think before we tweet, think before we text, we are going to be a very dissatisfied church in person. You can look at this all over the world today and all over our media. You can see the tweets, the pictures, the posts, 
that people say. People do. And you can see many people getting in trouble for a lot of different things, a lot of stupid things, a lot of very ignorant things, because they think with their heart and with their life and with their ambitions instead of think of what Christ would want for us. And if we are an ambassador to Christ, we have a mandate by God to represent, to speak for Christ and not for ourselves. If you have your Bibles, I need to give you this mandate that we have. It's found in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Now, when we're talking about our culture today, our culture today, our words are not just spoken words. Anytime that we write, anything that we post, anything that we tweet, anything that comes out of us is the words that we speak, and we have to take hold to those words. We have to take every thought captive of everything that we say and everything that we do. Because if we don't, there are ramifications, there are pains, there are hurts with every word that we say. If we do not take God's word into perspective, what are those things? The Bible says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may bring grace to the hearer. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, for just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. It is God's mandate to look at every word that proceeds out of our mouth and out of our text. You know, there's a show that, that uh, it, it's, a, it's a stupid show, and I hate watching it, but it's one of those that's kind of like a car wreck. You know, you're going to look at it, and you're going to watch it. It's uh, um, How to Catch a Predator. Anybody ever see that stupid show? It's these pervert guys going over on the Internet, trying to text and catch and try to get an underage boy or underage girl to have a relationship with him. And I'm thinking, how stupid, how stupid is it that you would go online or you would text and I'm thinking, how would you do that? How would you get caught up in such an environment that you would risk everything that you have, everything that you have worked for, for a text or a communication for a desired outcome? And I was thinking about that. Once we get caught up in a situation where we get so preoccupied on ourself that we do not think of the consequences or the ramifications of what we do, we have to think every word Everything that we say, everything that we do has consequences, and we must train ourselves to think differently. Not only to think differently, but we have to train ourselves to communicate differently. So our challenge today is very simple. is the words that we say, the words that we write, the texts that we send, the pictures that we send, are they God-honoring? And if they are not, we must first evaluate where our heart is because if my heart is in the wrong place, that's where my heart, my life, and my thoughts would be. So I want to give you three simple points with a, a couple points underneath each one. The first is harmful speech. Harmful speech. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Ooh. Tight ring on his tongue, or we could put that in the term of 2013, any words that we text or anything that we say. If we think we are religious and better than someone else, then our religion is dead. Our faith is dead. So where would I parallel that? When we're talking about harmful speech, I would say that if God's salvation and transformation within my life does not produce love for other people, I do not have God's love within my heart. And if I can look at animosity and hatred towards others, what I'm saying is God probably has not transferred my heart. And if I don't have love for others, I probably don't have love from God to my heart. So the evidence of my salvation is love, that one word. So I have to look, is my speech Harmful. I don't want to be a deceiver of myself playing the game of church but not having the vocabulary of God's love within my heart. The first one is gossip. Just gossip. It may be true, but it doesn't make any difference. Gossip. I believe in the church this is a horrific topic. 
under speech. Just gossip. I had a friend of mine give me a, a simple little outline. We've used it many times, but you could write it down. Think. Think before you talk. Here it is. T, is it true? Is it true? And then again, it doesn't make any difference if it's true or not. It's not your story to tell. But the first thing, is it true? And then, is it helpful? If I share this, am I helping them or am I gaining access to inward information? Is it true? Is it helpful? And then, is it inspiring? Am I helping them out? Am I inspiring them to be better? Am I confronting them or am I just gossiping about them? And then, is it even necessary that I even repeat this stupid junk? It's not my story to tell. I could be embarrassing somebody. Why don't I lift them up and pray for them, encourage them, instead of sharing gossip that's going to hurt them? And the last one, talking about, is it kind? Is it kind? Do I, do I need to even share this? Proverbs chapter 16, verse 28 says this. A perverse man stirs up dissension, and a gossiper separates close friends. A gossiper separates close friends. All it takes is for me to share my heart and my life with one person. And then that heart that I share with one person is spread to someone else. What happens? It causes dissension within my heart and it separates those friendships. A close friend will stick with you like a brother. A gossiper will cause dissension. So when I share somebody, when I help with somebody, it's not my story to tell. I must talk to them and love them. So gossipers cause dissension and it hates it causes division within brotherly love. B is lying. Lying, just lying. The Bible says God is truth. Therefore, his followers need to be truth. Be truthful in what we say. If I'm going to be a helpful speech, I need to not gossip, and I need to be truthful. I need to be truthful with a kind heart. And first, in order for me to be truthful, I have to understand who I am and what I've gone through. And understand that God's loved me and he's forgiven me. And my job is to love others through not gossip and not lies, but being genuinely honest within them. Put aside the fact that Jesus is truth, but Satan is the father of lies. So there's the contrast. If God is love and truth, Satan is liar and a deceiver. If I decide to lie, who am I following? If I absolutely know it to be true, and I lie, I am following the schemes and the deception of Satan. And if I am an ambassador for Christ, my first and biggest mandate is to follow after the truth that God has given to me. So, I can't gossip, and I shouldn't lie, but then I should, the wholesome, helpful speech is cursing. Using God's name properly. Not necessarily just saying a stupid word, hitting your finger with a hammer and saying something. We've all made those mistakes. We've all had loose lips in certain times within our life. But when we're posting or we're talking or we're communicating and the verbiage that comes out of our mouth is negative and condescending towards Christ and use God's name in vain, what we're saying is we are not being the ambassador that Christ wants us to be. So a foul mouth can cause division within the body of Christ. Because if we are posting, facing, or tweeting things that are contrary to God, what God wants us to Facebook, what he wants us to tweet, or what he wants us to say, and if we're saying one thing with our life, but another thing out of our life with our Facebook or when we're trying to tweet, we are bringing mixed signals. We cannot tweet, Facebook, and post one form of Christianity and then the very next form, post something that's completely opposite of God's will and God's way. That's called hypocrisy. That's living a lie, being somebody, being false. So our helpful speech has to be one that's honoring. We can't gossip, we can't lie, and we shouldn't curse. But then our helpful speech, verse 29, it says, About this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen with a gentle spirit when we communicate it can't be vindictive it can't be mean-spirited you know we say this in counseling all the time aggression sent is aggression met if I come and I get in your face because I don't like something that you what is your first response okay let's change it if you and your husband and your wife 
Okay, you're sitting in your living room, and all of a sudden something happens, and usually it's the wife, because the men are usually very nice and gentle and quiet in the spirit. Amen, I mean, that's what I'm saying. But say your wife has a bad day, and she just, just jumps all over you because you're watching the British Open. Let's say golf, okay? You're watching the British Open. She goes, you've been watching the British Open for the last five hours. Why don't you get up and do anything? And so she gets on your case. What is the first response? Well, my first response. You'd probably say, okay, honey, I'll do whatever you want. My first response, well, there's still three holes left. Give me another 20 minutes. Wait, all aggression sent is aggression met. And that's with people you love. Now let's take aggression sent on a world wide web or on social media. And you throw your political position or your racism out and you start throwing everything you believe about a certain topic, and what happens automatically, aggression sent is aggression met, and when you meet that aggression, it's going to come back full force. And when we do that for the body of Christ, and all of a sudden this section and this section has met each other in the middle, and it has blown up out of proportion, and then we're supposed to talk to you about Jesus. We're supposed to be the ambassador for Christ. Oh, forgive me what I said. I didn't mean to do it. Well, you did it. You can't unpluck a chicken. <laughs> you can't catch your words. Once it's out, it's out. Once you said it, you said it. It's hard. You can do a backstroke all day long, but people will never forgive and forget harmful mean-spirited words. So how do we do that? First, we have to be gentle. Proverbs 15, 1 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Sometimes, if I could use it in a different terminology, it's maturity. Being able to have an opposing position with a gentle spirit. I do not have to agree with everything that you agree with. I don't have to agree with everything that you post. And <laughs> believe me, I don't. But what my answer is, I have to be a quiet, gentle spirit. So what I can say is, you know what, you can have your position. Let me tell you why I don't like your position. It's because if I like your position, I'm opposing their position. And if I oppose their position, I cannot communicate the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to them. In a very volatile community or country, what we must do is we have to look at what is the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to transform lives to see Jesus Christ. So the first thing is I have to be gentle. And then I have to be instructive. I have to be instructive. I have to get into people's lives Helpful speech goes beyond criticizing someone for their position, but talking to them in a very interactive, loving, gentle conversation. If I do not agree with the position, and now I'm going to get on all the Facebook people here for a second. If I don't agree with you on position on Facebook, my job is not to argue with you on Facebook. My job is not to argue with your political position or your or your religious position, or your sexual position, or any position. My job is to communicate to you face-to-face, one-on-one. Because if I respect and I love you, I can disagree with you, but still love you. And instructively, what I can do is I can communicate, what does the Bible say? And if you disagree with what the Bible says, I still cannot give you I cannot list, I cannot, I I cannot give up my position because my position is a biblical position. I cannot condemn you of yours. I just cannot accept you. But I have to teach you or show you what the Word of God states. I can listen and I can communicate, not publicly, but privately. Because I have a bigger mandate than to argue or to win the fight or to let my position be known. 
My position is I want to be able to hold my position so I can share the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to those that may be opposing my position. Because if I only minister and if you only minister to the people that are already saved, you can argue all day long about a position spiritually. Whether we agree with this or disagree with this or whether it's pre-rapture, post-rapture, you know, we can argue all day long with that. But the people that are dying and going to hell, they could care less what your position is spiritually. They could care less. What they want to know is, do you accept me enough that you'll love me enough that you'll communicate the truth to me so I can see Christ within your life? So I have to be gentle, and I have to be instructively, and then what I have to do is I have to be edified. I have to edify. I have to lift them up. Edify means to help them up in their speech, lift them up, encourage them, and help them, and love them. Maybe they need that encouragement today, just like the drama said today, somebody that may be down and out, and they just have no hope. They don't know Christ. They come to church and they're wondering, what in the world is this church thing all about? And then if the church is divided and we're not healthy and all we have is animosity within our hearts and we don't like what's going on and we hate each other and we have a division within our spirit and somebody's dying and going to hell and they're wondering, what in the world is this church all about? Is because we have no focus. We're not lifting others up. All we're doing is looking at what we can gain out of what God has given to us. The Bible says, do not let any wholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building of others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. But only what is helpful in building others up. What does that mean? Sometimes, I'm, gonna, I'm just talking here. Sometimes we just need to shut up. Give me an amen. amen. Sometimes we need to click off and say, I'm going to bed. Sometimes we just need to swallow our pride and not do something that we shouldn't do. Not say something that we shouldn't say. Edify. Sometimes we have to look at where they are. And I always say this, and I think this is very important. You know, we are where we are spiritually. And we know where we are, and we understand where God has taken us. And many of us, God has rescued us and taken us to a different level where we were our entire life. And we're very satisfied where God has taken to us spiritually. To a point that we've been where we are so long, we take it for granted that God is blessing us and God is moving us to the next level. And so we've been saved, we've been transformed, we've been radically saved and and we're looking at and we say thank god for everything you've done for me so we're looking at the lens that everybody should be where i am i've been here i've been saved for 20 years i know the bible i know what god is doing so why can't you do what i do why can't you see what i see why can't you act like i act because that's the lens i am looking at everybody's life at what i have to remember i have to look at the lens of the world not from my perspective but from god's perspective And you know what God did? He sent his son down to a dying world and he lifted them up to transform their life. He didn't come to save the saved. He came to save the sinners. And what I have to do is I have to go down and always remember everything that I say, everything that I do, I have to get down to where God went down to send his son to die on the cross for all of us. I have to edify that. I have to lift them up and I have to look through the lens of a dying and hurting world and not through my lens of where I am but where they are. If I do that, then I can see the things that I say, the words that I type, can lift others up instead of condemn them. Then I could be beneficial in what I do. But the third one is holy speech. Holy speech. Holy speech, I don't mean talking biblical. The old King James language. Thou art the greatest Lord that has ever lived. How art thou doing today in thy fine day? You know, we're not talking the King James language and talking holy and doing the King James verbiage. Whenever we talk, we try to act more spiritual. We look more spiritual. We have to wear our coat and ties and everything that we do, we have to have a frown on our face and we have to act like everything's a sin and we hate everybody because nobody lives up to my standard. That's called being a Pharisee. What I believe holy speech means is just being genuinely open in front of people's lives, living your life, living our speech, one that people can see Christ in us, being holy in our speech. In Psalm 63, 6, it says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Because of what you've done for me, I am going to glorify God in my lips or in my words. How do we do that? First one is praise. When people see us, when people 
hear us, when they watch our Facebook, when they look at our Twitter account, or they see what we post on Pinterest, whatever we do in social media, they should see that God is genuinely the Lord of my life. Not just on Saturday nights when I'm getting prepared for church. We're talking, we ought to be able to praise God every day of our life. If we praise God during the great days, and we praise God during the sad days, what happens are those 130 friends that we have on Facebook, they're saying, wow, that's genuine. He's not spewing his anger, his hatred. He's not spewing his hurt and his pain. He's praising God. In the midst of his praise, he can be lifted up with people's help and people's opinions. He can be encouraged. Praising is God's power through prayer. Just lifting God up through any avenue that we have. Letting God be glorified. So after we praise God through our words, our testimony is very important. We all are not evangelists. We're not all preachers. We all don't know the word of God that we can get up and we can spew the word of God out and tell everybody what the Bible says about every different topic and say, you're wrong about this, you're right about this, this is what Daniel says, this is what Ephesians says. We're not all preachers and, and Bible scholars. But we all are believers in Jesus Christ that have the vehicle in order to share your testimony with Christ. And in our words, in social media, and in our life, our job, our mandate, is to be able to share my testimony, my life, my story, in a very simple way that people can look at my life and they know who I am every day of my life. They may even see my pain. They may see my hurt. I may be vulnerable in a certain time and share something that's going on within my life. And if I do that, I'm just sharing my story. I'm not putting my opinion on your opinion or what you think against mine. Sometimes I may put myself out there. Sometimes I may be vulnerable. But I'm telling my story in order for my story to bring glory to God. And if I tell my story and give my testimony, and my testimony is how God saved me, how God is using me, and not everything that I go through is wonderful. Sometimes Christianity is a pain. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard work. Sometimes we don't understand what God is doing. Sometimes he takes us down a path that we, we wish we didn't have to go down. But God has taken us down that path, so I have to glorify God in that path. And if I glorify God in that path, he will rescue me and he'll take me where I need to go. So in our testimony, our testimony is simply a story. What is God doing? What is God doing real within my life? If we would take our words, let no unwholesome speech come out of our mouth, but yet what is good and necessary to edify and my brothers and sisters in Christ, I can tell my story what I end up getting to do is witness. Witness. When the woman at the well, she, was, she had a horrendous life. She was married a few times and she was living with another guy. She had no inner joy within her life. She encountered Jesus. And when she encountered Jesus, Jesus sat beside her and Jesus talked to her. And Jesus gave her water that wasn't any like any other water, a living water, and Jesus transferred her heart. And you know what she did? She ran back into town, and she said, let me show you a man that knows everything I have ever done and still loves me. Let me show you him. And in our witness, whatever we do, it's not about the junk that we go through. It's about who can rescue us through the junk that we are going through. Let me show you a man that can take care of every issue that you have. The words that we say is bottom line a condition of our heart. And if we have a negative, bad heart, what's going to happen? It's going to spew out of our lips onto our paper, onto our wall, onto our texts. It's going to cause havoc within our life. 
as a believer in Jesus Christ, my challenge as your pastor is before you say, think. Before you type, pray. Before you text, evaluate. Is what I'm about ready to say right? Is it wholesome? Is it above reproach? Am I getting to people's lives for a purpose? Or am I just giving my opinion? And as I said early in the sermon, you have a right to your opinion. And nobody can change your opinion. You have that right. Jesus gave to us a country that we are free to proclaim the freedom of truth and the freedom of speech. But we, we have a bigger purpose. We can use a tool that is the most popular tool in the face of the world today. And that tool is social media. If we use the tool of social media to bring glory to God, not to be negative about God, to bring glory to others instead of being negative about others, God can allow us to use a tool to bring glory to his name. There's nothing wrong with Facebook. Well, there are some things wrong with Facebook. But we can use Facebook. We can use Twitter. We can use Pinterest. We can use, if you want to go old school, MySpace. We can use all that stuff if we use it to bring glory to his name. If we put devotions out, if we put thoughts out, if we're not hypocritical, but we're genuine. So every word that we say, take captive. Think before we talk. Think before we type. And if we do that, what we can do is we can take Ephesians chapter 4 and we can say, this is my prayer, that I let no corrupt word proceed out of my mouth, but only what is good and necessary to edify others, that I get to impart grace to the hearers. And I do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God who gave me my salvation and sealed it through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want all bitterness and I want all wrath and anger and clamor and I want all my evil speaking to be put away with all malice. Don't even let me think about it. And I want to be kind to one another. I want to be tender hearted and I want to forgive others just as God forgave me. And if I can do that, I know I'm going to offend people. I know I have offended people. But I want to let my words be seasoned with grace tapered with salt and let people know that my biggest purpose in life is to bring glory and honor to him. I am thankful for my salvation. My goal is to lead others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through my words. If we think about that, everything that we say and everything that we do is important. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I don't have an invitation all the time. But I think invitations sometimes are very, very important. It may not be an invitation where you come forward. But we are going to have music in order for you if you would like to do that. But I think an invitation is a time that you can respond to God. Your words, your actions, your heart. And maybe even the ability to forgive and even ask God to forgive is very important. Because we speak and we write and we post so many words. So many words sometimes that we don't even think that we do and we don't even know the consequences of what we say. But we need to ask God to help me, to guide me, to guide me through the things that I say to be the testimony that I need to be. And sometimes we just have to take every day, every sentence, every word, and we have to think the consequences of that word and of that phrase and of my position and give it to God and let God work through it. Let God forgive you. Let God clean your heart. Let God clean your mind and let God work in a great way with every word that we speak. Because words are very powerful. I want to pray. And then as I pray, I want you to think about what God has spoken to you. And maybe you need to come down and pray and let God work within your life. Maybe you need to ask God to 
help you, to train you, to equip you, to think different. Or maybe you need to ask somebody to forgive you. Or maybe you need to ask somebody forgiveness. It's all about what is our purpose? What is the mandate that God has called Glenville, called you to do? And I pray that it is to be the ambassador in every action of my life. Let me pray. Dear Father, Lord, we all need to forgive and we all need forgiveness. We've all said and we've all done stupid things. We've all posted. We've all said things that were argumentative that need your forgiveness. But Lord, today, in our culture today, in our society, and in our country, where it is so divisive, I pray, Lord, that we as a church can stand up against any type of racism, any negative thought, any political agenda that does not bring glory to your name. We can hold to that position, but understand the position that I hold is secondary to the position that you have given to me, and that is to be a child of God. Let me give me the ability to put that down in order to have you high and lifted up so I can point and communicate the love and the forgiveness of God to every person, whether they agree with me or they do not, I can be genuinely real before you and them. Break my heart. Let me start being the ambassador that you want me to be today through my actions and through my words. We thank you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I will ask you to please stand to your feet. Greg's going to lead this song. And an invitation is just an opportunity for you to talk. Maybe come down and say, maybe you said something to family or to friends or to a coworker or a church member that maybe you said, you know what, I'm sorry about that. Before you talk to them, talk to God. Allow God to work within your life so he can transform your life so you can talk to others. It's all about the heart. If we need to talk to God, please do so today so God can work within your life to minister to others. Let us sing this song.